Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, in this presentation, I will share my observations on post-medieval graffiti in caves on a mountain in central Greece. The name of the mountain is Pelion, and it's located on a peninsula in Thessaly. So these are data from a multidisciplinary survey project that looked at how um, caves were used mainly in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Uh, documentation of our graffiti was uh, carried out together with a collection of artifacts from uh, cave floors and supplemented with no less than 113 informant interviews. The point that I would like to, to illustrate here is a case of how graffiti, when combined with archaeological survey and collection of ethnographic data, can provide insights about some of the ways that people engage with the countryside that are not easily recognizable in other ways. So post-medieval graffiti has never raised a lot of interest in Greece, and certainly not that of formal academic study. And it, it's a pity, really, because there is a rich tradition in Greece um, for making images and inscriptions on natural rock surfaces throughout the post-medieval period. So let's look at an example here. Here's a very small cave on a steep slope on the inland side of Mount Pelion. There's not very much room uh, inside this little feature, and it can only fit a couple of persons for a short period, uh, typically uh, during bad weather. Um, one of the cave walls uh, contains a wealth of, of delicate uh, small graffiti. These are clearly not made for making, um, for, for broadcasting messages to people passing by, and they seem more to have been made for individual contemplation. Um, a group of images show three figures in a boat, really. They seem to be quite small vessels, and in each case there is a larger human figure standing inside the boat, sometimes accompanied by two smaller figures. Um, the larger figure, I think, clearly has a, a dominant or a protective role, and his arms are like outstretched uh, over the two smaller figures. To me, he looks like a a helmsman perhaps holding a steering oar from the boat stern, but I'm very happy to hear your uh, suggestions. Uh, the steering oar may also be interpreted as a fishing net or a landing net um, because of its pattern shape. And the larger figure is also uh, holding something from its left hand that extends to the waist. And in one image, the small figure in the stern appears to be holding a fishing line with an attached hook. And, and as you can see, there are clear stylistic variation, and that indicates to me the contribution of several individual artists. But all four images, I think, are quite striking in their thematic similarity. Is this a religious portrayal of Jesus fishing with two brothers, Simon and Andrew? In the Bible, Jesus, on several occasions, he preaches from these uh, small fishing boats. A more straightforward religious illustration is an angel with wings and a halo surrounding the head, and he's holding a round object, possibly a holy apple. There are also horses or pack mules mounted with a rider, and in one case of a human figure leading the animal uh, by a rope. And some of these animals, as you can see, appear to be carrying pack loads tied onto their backs. The cave, unfortunately, has provided no dating evidence for this uh, strange mix of commercial and relig relig religious graffiti. Um, but the location of the cave uh, may provide some clues as it is close to one of the important regional trading routes uh, just outside the village of Makrenitsa. So transport to Pelion during the 18th and 19th centuries um, was carried out uh, primarily with pack animals, um, singly or in, in, in caravans. And since Macronita was perceived as, um, um, say, the economic center of, of West Pelion well into the uh, 19th century, 
major roads emanated from it and most caravans passed through it. So did travelers sometimes find temporary shelter in this small cave before entering or leaving Makrinitsa? Yeah, I think it seems possible. Scenes as the one uh, depicted here uh, with the pack animals would have been common in the 18th century and 19th centuries when a steady stream of, of, of traders with pack animals transported goods in and out of the region. So Pelion on the caves and the caves on the mountain are commonly associated with the untamed, with the wild. This is the homeland of dragons and not least of the famous and fierce Kentaurs, the mythical half-man, half-horse, cave-dwelling creature of which there are many stories on Pelion reaching back far into antiquity. Graffiti images from Pelion portray animals, human figures or specific objects, <coughs> but they all seem to be related to domestication, to trade or to religion. And that is something I find interesting. The fact that the images have no obvious link to the wild is quite striking. It's tempting perhaps to speculate that domestication themes was a way for transhuman shepherds to conciliate themselves with the hardships of animal husbandry and other work on the mountain. In that way, a simple drawing of a small house perhaps could mirror a longing for the home village perhaps hundreds of kilometers away. A different type of yearning is expressed in the frequent depiction of crosses that we find. Crosses and angels uh, show us that rock engravings around caves sometimes have religious connotations. Crosses are often accompanied by initials, showing the artist's desire to connect his identity um, to expressions of faith and moral purity. It's interesting in, in this aspect that we didn't encounter sexual images or writing indicating sexual themes, which are otherwise quite common in, in this sort of sheep herd art in, in other parts of the world. Graffiti in the Pelion Cave suggests that the practice of writing dates or someone's initials emerges in the last decades of the 19th century. Shepherds generally could not read or write, um, and it's possible that the dates and initials were made by hikers or independent visitors. However, the engravings, I think, are most likely from shepherds, as most of these caves are not really obvious targets for visitors. They're quite remote, many of them. Moreover, many of the dates are made with a special knife carving technique that requires good practice and available time, something which is characteristic of shepherds. So pastoralists undoubtedly learn rock carving techniques from each other and had time to perfect their skills. Most graffiti are expedient and naive, but in some cases the shepherd took great care to form elaborate letters and numbers, as you can see here, or to highlight his initials by circling framing or underlining and that especially in places where other people had already put their names this is typically particularly for dates of the 1930s and names and initials were in a few cases accompanied by a reference to a village or the outline of a torso that may portray the visitor himself so here are some examples of that um, we have a line portrait in profile that shows a serious bald guy. That could be me. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can see vertical uh, and horizontal line on the torso that, that gives the impression that the person perhaps is wearing a sweater. Um, below the image are the dates um, and a statement that the artist, he's a forest guard, uh, Vasophilakas, um, from the village of Makvenitsa. Another line portrait next to him uh, shows a young man with long hair and a possible headband. He's wearing a shirt or a coat with a folded over collar. The upper body is shown on fast, but the head is drawn in semi-profile. And this, this uh, uh, type of drawing is very typical of Albanian or Vlach shepherds. 
Now, there's a clear orientation towards personal identification rather than group identification. And social references, like for instance to sports teams, were surprisingly absent. Um, a single case of political graffiti was discovered at one cave with the slogan Red Revolution, Kokini Ibanastasi, was signed by Dimitris on May 1st, 1944. So most likely Dimitris here, he belonged to a group of left-wing partisans who had their headquarters and illegal printing press at a nearby monastery. One characteristic of cave graffiti is that it, get, it, it doesn't really get painted over or erased. It, it stays there. And it then becomes possible to look at long-term trends simply by counting the engraved years from each decade. And so this is what we did. The 1930s, the 1950s, and the 1990s stand out as these decades saw more <coughs> caves being engraved with a high number of dates. While it's difficult really to establish the significance of many dates, I think these clusters uh, suggest increased pastoral activity in and around caves during these periods. A new characteristic from the 1930s, not previously seen on, on our mountain here, is that closely spaced dates from the same or succeeding years are left in the same pastoral caves. In some cases, this could point to continuous use by the same or perhaps cooperating shepherds. That there are very few dates from the end of the 1940s is understandable because that was the period of the Greek Civil War and the mountains were perceived unsafe territory. Partisans were frequently using caves as hideouts and were renowned for stealing livestock from the villagers. And of course, this would have put limitations to shepherding practices. The 1990s saw both an increase in tourism and an influx in Albanian immigration, and there's quite little doubt that both groups had an impact on the number of dates being engraved, especially since um, Albanians uh, often found employment as shepherds when they arrived in Greece. Finally, uh, you can ask why there's a drop in graffiti dates in the most uh, recent decades. A possibility, I think, is uh, the increasing use of digital camera and smartphones. They influence how people uh, document their visit to places in the landscape. So what we ended up with was a broad framework which included the major cultural historical developments in the region matched to the graffiti data. This is a very tentative exercise, of course, with, with many, many uncertainties. But our point really with this was to underline that an understanding of the graffiti in the caves of Pelion and elsewhere, of course, require that they are placed in their proper social, economic and chronological context. It's clear that there existed a graffiti tradition alongside established pastoralism throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And of course, this is certainly not unique to Pelion, but it's a phenomenon that can be easily observed uh, by visiting caves throughout the entire Mediterranean. Most graffitis are located in areas um, where herders would pass by regularly, either daily or on a, or on a seasonal basis, and would, and would want to Com commemorate a, a stay at a cave or rock shelter. Um, other categories of cave users also produce graffiti that could be traders, people seeking refuge, um, hikers, hermits or casual visitors, and of course people who wanted to deceive archaeologists. Here's an illustration of an attempt to fool archaeologists in the 1960s the 2004 date, I have to say, was added later. Um, the very, very unfortunate Greek archaeologist who discovered these drawings, uh, he was extremely excited, uh, and he actually published them in a journal. So be careful with fake graffiti. Um, 
Without the support of documentary, ethnographic or other evidence, it's really difficult to know the motives for creating post-medieval cave graffiti. Meaning, of course, is mainly derived in relation to their specific reference to individuals of various social and ethnic groupings in the form of initials and names. The regular occurrence of pastoral graffiti in the caves on Pelion indicates that the intentions for the graffiti was much more than just coping with boredom. Graffiti is an appropriation of place that sends a message to other pastoralists um, that the particular cave is being used. In some cases, an engraved date is updated by the same shepherd in subsequent years. This clearly shows that the graffiti is not just a visiting card, but also a tool to show other um, that the use of the cave is recent. So in this way, graffiti may point um, to how people are not just passive consumers of places, but active participants whose actions um, influence the perceptions and actions of others. So finally, by looking at caves the way we have done here, we achieve quite a lot, I think. The evidence of people writing on cave walls gives us a new way of exploring the history of these modest and often hidden places in the landscape. Graffiti provides a more dynamic perspective on cave use, the role that caves <coughs> play in the landscape, and to transformations of the local community and economy. Not least, graffiti can shed light on the lives of shepherders and other cave users who might not otherwise appear in conventional narratives. And this, I think, is an appro appropriate supplement to the history books. Thank you very much.